uh, an exhibit of uh, my photos has made the rounds over the years, but uh, a selection is going to be uh, at the Phantom Gallery, which is located at the corner of Berteau and Irving, excuse me, and Damon tonight at 7 o'clock. So I'd love it if some of you who, uh, who listen to the show and uh, are available to come out tonight, come out and see some nice pictures. Very nice pictures, Michael. Congratulations on the opening. Um, did you have another announcement? I can't remember. Yeah, I thought so. Um, the uh, Sunday Glenwood Avenue Market, of course, is still happening, even through the construction. Tomorrow it'll be on the east side of the tracks. I want to give out a big shout and welcome to back to the heartland to our alderman and good friend of uh, a uh, safe haven that's Alderman Joe Moore. Hey, Joe. Hail and hearty. We've had a lot of politicians through here. Kelly Cassidy was in here this yeah, morning. Yeah, Kelly, our state and rep. And Joe Moore is here, so uh, the 49th Ward rocks. It, it does indeed. It does indeed. All right, indeed. speaking of rocks, there's a play <laughs> that we saw last night. What is that? I don't know, Katie. It was okay. just what came to mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, Chicago has been, um, for many, many years, under the, uh, the cloud of... Uh, what I can't say it any other way, but police torture. And uh, it's become a big deal, and uh, many of you know about the John Burge case. We've talked about it on this show many times. Actually, we had John Conroy up a uh, long time ago. Probably he talked about Ireland and Israel and Chicago. Uh, but, uh, you know, if it wasn't for, for John Conroy, our next guest, uh, this case, who knows what it would happen, because he stayed on the case for 20, 25 years. He could fill us in. So good morning to you, and we want to all say thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Katie. Um, John, the, uh, first of all, you're a journalist, right? That's your first, yes. That's yes. your first and last and middle job, right? Right. How did you come to become a playwright? It was really an accident, a... Uh, a theatrical uh, director and, and movie director and producer named John Hancock who directed Bang the Drum Slowly, an early De Niro film, and uh, he did a Nick Nolte prison film called Weeds. Oh, yeah. uh, he was directing two plays here in Chicago um, in, in 2007 and producing them. Uh, one was called The Brother. It was about the brother of Ethel Rosenberg. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he had written the script from a New York Times reporter's book. Um, and the other was Night Mother, a two-character suicide play. And um, he called me up and said, uh, you know, I'm interested in this bird story. Could we have coffee? I said, sure. And we talked. And he said, you know, I think there's a play in this. Would you be interested in writing it? Of course, I didn't want anybody else to do it. So I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then not knowing anything about theater, I wrote a what is now a nine-character play, what used to be a 13-character play, and uh, if you were really trying to be successful in theater, you would write a two-character play, you know, so, oh. because you it's mean cheaper the to produce. Oh, <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, we, wa we saw it last night, it, and it was a stunner. Uh, everyone in it was wonderful. The guy who played the cop was incredibly good for how much... He was like... We really just liked him. <laughs> that was David Parks who's yes. here. And we, David Parks is somewhere in the crowd here today. Right there. Hey, oh, David, oh, good morning to you. Made it. Great. We might ought to get him up here, too. Um, <laughs> the, uh, well, the story, uh, most of our listeners know about the John Burge um, uh, tragedy uh, for Chicago uh, and for numerous mostly young men and um, probably all young black men who were tortured at his hands and, and in the basement of Area 2 uh, over God knows how many years when you broke the story, which was in what year was that? 1990. 1990. 22 years ago. So. And it was in the reader that you did yeah. it? Yeah. 
And it was a huge story. I remember when the reader's yes. stories were huge. Yeah. So I'm like, what did I read last night? 20,000 words? I think it was 19,000 something, yeah. Gee, many Christmas. Did anybody finish it? Well, you know, it was a different <laughs> era. People had time. They read. <laughs> yeah, there was you, no Facebook. We didn't yet. have a, right. uh, didn't any, no texting. No. <laughs> That's right. They had a slightly longer attention. What first span. caught your attention about the Birch case that made you uh, want to be the reporter who stayed on the case for so long? Well, I. Uh, was looking to do a book on torture at the urging of an editor at uh, Alfred Knopf, and I was looking for uh, some case studies to put in, and I wanted people to choose case studies in which people would identify with the torturers, and a friend of mine called me and said, you know, there was this guy in federal court named Andrew Wilson, whom I remembered had shot dead two cops in 1982, and he claimed he'd been tortured, and so I went down there to yeah, not expecting a whole lot, and uh, and his he testified, and he uh, and he had these incredible photographs of uh, what he looked like when he came out of the police station. Among them, uh, some of his ears that de depicted it looked like a little alligator had come up and bit him. Uh, scabs in the shape of alligator clips, and he said he'd been wired up to a hand crank device, much like an army field phone, that. Uh, gave him electric shock and he'd been shocked by a second device as well and uh, and then the police took the stand and he also had burns on his chest from a radiator and the police took the stand and said no those uh, those aren't burns uh, those are abrasions and he probably got him when he jumped over the car to uh, shoot the other officer and um, and then, uh, and the, he couldn't have been burned because the radiator didn't work. And in the, and but the trial ended in a mistrial. And in the second trial, they said the radiator did work. He inflicted them on himself. himself. Mm. And uh, we've got a jailhouse informant here who will tell you the truth. And this jailhouse informant had an Interpol file that said, "Beware, this man will commit fraud in your country." But the jury didn't know that, and so they ended up with a very confused verdict. But I was hooked from that point. Yeah. And you did do a book uh, on torture in Northern Ireland, or in, and Israel, and here in Chicago. Yes, it was called uh, "Unspeakable Acts, Ordinary People: The Dynamics of Torture." It was an attempt to explain how ordinary people become torturers, what happens to torture victims, why societies turn a blind eye when it appears. Which why do societies turn a blind eye? Because it's uh, it's in our face. Yes, it's. Um, it, it seems like a, a mystery, but it, it, when you boil it down, it, it isn't. Um, first of all, it's much easier to see uh, torture in another country. Uh, so we point at things in other countries and say that's torture, and then we might be doing them ourselves. Um, secondly, the um, there is a sort of a, a bystander effect well known in psychological circles where uh, the more people who know about something, the less likely it is that someone will do anything about it. Uh, for example, the Kitty Genovese murder in, in Queens in, I think it was 63, yeah. I can't remember the it year. It was in the 60s, yeah. yeah. Uh, 38 of her neighbors saw her killed over the course of a half hour and nobody called the police. Um, and th and then there is the whole idea of when someone like Burge um, goes out there and is pushing the envelope, um, he drags a whole lot of people with him um, because, it, and eventually the whole society is is, is behind it. Um, it. You know, initially it's just the two cops or three cops in the room and the, and the victim, and then it becomes the state's attorney who knows or suspects and, uh, and his or her superior. In the Andrew Wilson case, it was clear that um, it, there was something seriously wrong with that case, and Richard Daly was the state's attorney, and it, it's very clear that um, he, if he didn't know, um, it would be a, a remarkable feat. Um, right. And uh, and and then because you don't want to pro you don't want to prosecute guys who have arrested two cops, you, you wink you at shot that. two cops. Yeah, shot, I'm sorry, shot two cops. You you wink at that one, and then uh, y you can't then. And when the next one comes up, you now can't prosecute because you would end up having to go after those other officers, and the conspiracy just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then there's indifference in the part of the community because the victims are from a torturable class, people who are just beyond the pale of our 
compassion and uh, so it just grows and grows. The torturable class, class. <laughs> which was an, uh, a, a phrase in the play last night, just stings you to hear that. And, and it's, it really... To I woke up this morning trying to remember what it was. Torturable yeah, class. Yeah, I just came back to um, Yeah, it, there is, well, part of the historic and still pretty deep uh, abject racism of the city of Chicago in all of our history and in our leadership and certainly all the period of time you're talking about um, was uh, fed this ability to look past people as human beings and see them as, like you said, well, you don't want to really mess with a guy who's killed two cops. I remember when those two cops were killed and I remember, yeah, I remember what day. happened after that happened. And it was a knockdown. Every household in the communities, um, you know, it was like wind up the usual suspects kind of moment, only it was terrifying to the families and the people in the neighborhoods to who the police just descended upon, uh, I mean literally blockaded the neighborhoods while they went door to door. Um, I, I don't know to this day if they got the right guy um, because that method of theirs, their methods were, you know, find somebody, wind up the usual suspects. And I also remember Mike Royko um, just foaming at the mouth racism in his column about these guys. And it, I, I actually ran into Royko on the running path one day. He was not running, he was walking. But I knew it was him from behind for some reason. And I didn't stop running, but I said something about him like, you never should have written that way about those brothers. And he was like, wait, wait. Come here and talk to me. And I didn't want to because he had also written about some people I know and I didn't want to get it into loose. that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, one of the things that I think is your motivation around this stuff is um, trying to figure out why people are not outraged or don't do something about it, which is a, a really good question. You know, in our own lifetimes, Nazi Germany um, stands as a glaring example of people. Well, you know, just on that front, there's, uh, I got an email today, it was about uh, people seem to forget about Exelon, people forget about the wars that the Bush administration got us into, but they're pissed off, excuse me, at Obama for bringing us health care. You yeah. know, it's like weird, of all the things that come down and people ignore, turn their head the other way and don't want to face, but then they'll, they'll turn on someone, which clearly I think has to do with race. Uh, back, let's go back to the play for a minute. Uh, in the play, it took me a minute to figure out, we weren't just, there was a guy in the play, who, the character who is, uh, I guess, the John Birch character, but has a different name. So uh, our friend Russ explained to me after, I said, well, what's it about the blah, blah, blah? And he said, he said no, it's a, it's a conglomeration of all of these cases, and you put it together. Yeah. I think they um, call it a compilation. A compilation. <laughs> That's good. I and like you that also you call it a conglomeration. Um, movie. Uh, the first thing I said coming out of there, besides checking the White Sox score, was, you know, this should be a movie. And as there, and I have a friend who I've worked in a number of his movies. He's a Chicago guy, Andy Davis. And my first thought was, oh, I got to talk to Andy and see if he'd be interested. But have do you, you have any movie stuff going on on this? No, no. We're only in the beginning stages of trying to get other theaters involved uh, around the country. And, uh, and how's so, that going? Um, it's difficult to say because uh, the scripts just went out last week and typically there are sometimes backed up theater might have months of scripts to read through. Uh, so, uh, but some of the theaters around the country have asked for a few uh, asked for copies. We didn't have to pitch them. So, how well, did it end up going with uh, Timeline Theater? How did you uh, um, get involved with these well, folks at a, the a Wellington very Avenue lucky Church? Lucky stroke um, for me. Um, I had several readings, um, and uh, I had been inviting people in the theater community to them, and uh, a sort of a, a lucky thing happened in that. Um, Two people from the Timeline Company, uh, Laura Getch, Lara Getch and uh, Ben Thiem, came to see a reading at Northwestern University Law School at the same time that uh, Nick Bowling, who eventually directed the play, and P.J. Powers were looking at the script. And so 
um, there was a sort of meeting of the minds and they liked the script and decided to do it. They um, did so well with it. Oh, I, I can't tell you. The play changed so dramatically um, once it got to them. Um, for instance, the character of both of them, the prisoner, was off stage in the earlier version. I had a different prisoner who had only committed his crime had only been to steal four tires from a car that had been used in a homicide. And they said to me, that's too easy for our audience. We need a bad guy. We want Otha. And I'd been reluctant to write Otha because he's mentally ill, and I thought it would be much harder to write a mentally ill character. Um, and this is the one played by Charles Gardner? Yes. Yeah. He was good. Yeah, he was good. Yeah. They're all good. Yes, they're, they're all, all good. Um, yeah. there, there were certain ways that uh, this set uh, um, handled the story that were completely unique and wonderful. Um, the one particularly where um, Mr. Dawson, who now was in the um, the pound, the, the oh, parking... Police auto pound, yeah. The p police auto pound was actually um, going through conversations with three different individuals. It was all there on the stage at once but the audience knew that these were three different visits from these three different I think there were five. Maybe. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, was, yeah, I was thinking yeah. it was more than three. Yeah. Uh, how wonderfully staged that was. Oh, it was amazing. And yeah. another one when at the same table, two different conversations uh, apart from one another happening at different times were happening right there. And again, the audience was right on on up with the story and knew what was going on. I mean, I, I just thought that was incredibly cool. Yeah, uh, for that lack was of Nick a Bowling, the director. Um, he's Nick a Bowling. genius. Yeah, and he uh, originally was thinking there would be four different areas in the stage, and then he thought the stage is too small right. to have four. And he came up with that idea of the central table, and then the script followed a lot of that. It was tremendous. Yeah. Tremendous. Uh, uh, let me let me ask you. Um, uh, about the TV that's in, up above, and I oh, didn't yeah. see it all the time. I, you know, would have a sort of in-between scenes. You'd have uh, you, the, the TV would be on, and Clinton would be up there, or there'd be some local news up there. But then Katie kind of said to me, I checked, did you see Isaiah Thomas? And what was the meaning of uh, the, the selection of the, the, the TV scenes you had showing, and particularly that one with Isaiah Thomas? Well... Uh, it, I didn't choose the video. The video, we had a video designer, um, and the purpose of the video was to set time right. so that the audience would look and see, oh, friends and ER are coming up next. Okay, now I understand when that time was. And then you see a very, uh, couple minutes of Letterman, and he looks young, and you realize, oh, this is... Well, lately he looks like he's dyed his hair blonde. <laughs> or he's <laughs> been in the sun with lemon. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, it was oh, it's to set time, except for the last one, which did set time. It, it's a shot of uh, Dave Wanstatt, the the, uh, the Chicago Bears coach, and, and it, it says the Bear game is coming on later today. And the next scene is in a bar, and uh, David Parks, uh, the actor who plays Dan Breen, comes into the bar to knowing that uh, the uh, it's owned by uh, the father of the state's attorney in this case and knowing that the state's attorney would be there helping out because the bear game is on later that day yeah so. so Isaiah Thomas no meaning on that one well not to me maybe there was to the uh, you yeah. know you talked about this hand crank device and uh, in the you know people refer to it throughout the case as something like a hair straightener uh, but it turns out, is this is true, I assume, that th there was this, this th device that really was about, I guess it was for torture. Well, Tell us, it, fill us in on it. It's, uh, it's called the Violet Ray Machine, and it was uh, invented around the turn of the last century, in the 1900s. And it uh, came in a black case, uh, and the deluxe models included all different kinds of glass tubes that you would put in, on the end of it, and when you turned it on, the gas in those glass tubes would glow violet, which is why it was called a violet ray machine, and you would use it, it was advertised as, as a cure-all for everything. It could cure 
Sunspots. Uh, it could cure female <laughs> hysteria. It was one of the things it was alleged to cure. Hallelujah. It, it could, <laughs> it could, you know, remove warts. It could, uh, you know, th help with thyroid problems. Uh, you know, anything you can think of. People were using it to see if they could grow hair on bald people, um, and it was. Uh, they had a metal attachment, which. Um, you can now buy this device on S&M websites, and on those sites, it's advertised as causing sharp, painful shocks. Jeez. And uh, when you put this metal attachment on the end of it, it looks exactly like a curling iron. And five or six of the guys who were tortured with this device used those words. They called it either a curling iron or a hair curler, but that's what it looks like. Uh. And uh, nobody knew what it was. And, and in about, and in fact, um, Burge's lawyer contended the device didn't exist because you couldn't have a device you plugged into the wall and shock somebody with without the danger of killing them. And in about, two, I forget the year, maybe 2003, I started calling around, and I, I called a, a museum of uh, ancient medical um, devices up in Minneapolis, and I described what these guys had described, and the woman said, oh, yeah, I think that's a violet ray machine. Oh. And then she says, here's the number of a guy who's got a virtual museum of these on the web down in Texas. So I called that guy, and, he, and I sent him the descriptions of the five guys, and he said, you know what? Uh, there were, you know, dozens, maybe hundreds of these machines, different varieties. I bet you I could pin that down to the model based on this description. And hundreds of thousands of them were manufactured in Chicago. It was banned by the FDA in the 1950s, early 50s. Wow. You are listening to the Live from the Heartland show. This is Michael James with Katie Hogan, and we're talking to our friend John Conroy, who... Uh, is a, a writer, a uh, journalist, and now a playwright. Uh, his play, My Kind of Town, talks about the, uh, basically addresses torture in the Chicago Police Department, and uh, it is being performed at the Timeline Theater at the Wellington Avenue Church. And how long is it going to be going, John? Till the end of July. So a couple more weeks. Yeah. Um, I really would encourage. We recommend I'll go see it. Yeah, exactly. Um, did you write the the history of torture thing for the uh, the uh, program that I read last night? Uh, it was oh was the it? history of torture. No, that was the dramaturg. Uh, Marin Robinson wrote that. Uh, um, but there is also a timeline. I've not been to Timeline Theater before, but I I wonder if it's a normal no piece they, of theirs. They, that they changed do. the lobby display to fit the play. So. Mm -hmm. Last night there was a timeline of the torture scandal starting in 1968 and going up till 2012 all around the walls. Mm -hmm. And in the middle there's a cow from the per Cows on Parade. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Cow, cow is a vase yeah. of flowers. With a vase of flowers. Supposed to symbolize what the city was actually concerned with while all this torture uh -huh. was going on. Wow. Well, speaking of the city, let's talk about uh, then state's attorney, then become mayor, Daly. And, um, Do we have to? I just want to get John's take on it. I mean, it seems to me that uh, Daly, uh, in many ways, could be implicated throughout this whole uh, series of negative events. And uh, he seems to have skated on it and many other things. He did plant trees and build his bike paths. But do you have any comment on, uh, do you think Daly will ever come to any kind of, there'll be any kind of justice around his role in this? Uh, no, I don't. Um, he's supposed to be deposed in, I think, in September uh, in a civil suit. Um, Michael Tillman uh, in federal court uh, got permission uh, from the judge to keep him as, keep Richard Daly as a defendant um, in the case because Daly was state's attorney when this was going on and he, uh, no doubt, in my mind, uh, knew, and I can explain it at length why I think that, but uh, I don't expect much to come out of this deposition because um, I would expect that the mayor will say, uh, I don't recall, I don't remember. So you've spent a lot of time on a subject that most people don't really want to think about as, as is part of your research, that people really don't want to look at this stuff. But I think in the same time that Chicagoans were being faced with the reality of Area 2, 
and what was going on, thanks to your uncovering it, um, well, into past 2000, we had the moment where we saw all these horrible pictures from Abu Ghraib prison, and I felt, I felt, I mean, in my bones, in my blood at that time, the, the country's just utter uh, shame and uh, horror that their boys and girls were over there taking part in activities that U.S. citizens like to think that's what the enemy does. We treat our prisoners well, whereas they torture us. Um, and that broke that wide open. And then, of course, evidently there were just scores and scores of pictures that were never released. Why is it easier to actually talk about, look at, and grapple with a problem over there than what's right here in our own backyard? You know, Katie, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's too uncomfortable. Right now, um, there's a scandal in Los Angeles where the uh, county jail uh, run by the LA County Sheriff, um, there are uh, such serious allegations of brutality that they amount to torture, um, including a, 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 a sheriff's officer uh, shoving a flashlight up a guy's rectum. The word torture is not used in any of the press coverage or even in the ACLU report. Mm -hmm. um, and it is torture. There's no question about it. Uh, it, it, it back in the 80s, there was a uh, in L.A. again, there, the uh, canine unit was allowing its officers to, I mean, it was allowing its dogs to bite people once they cornered them. And so in like a three-year period, I forget the numbers, they're in my book, but there might have been 300 bites in L.A. and there were 32 in Chicago. And, uh, and that's torture. Yes. Uh, nobody used that word. Those officers, are, you know, did not suffer greatly in that, you know, remain on the force. And yeah. John Conroy, the uh, uh, a question that's kind of uh, circling in my head is uh, what do you think the impact of uh, the John Birch case and the expose around it has had on the police department uh, here in Chicago and maybe beyond? Is there hope? Is there, are we, will we go back to those kind of activities? What do you, what's your take on it? Um, my take is that uh, the guys who did this were a really small number of the officers on the force, mm -hmm. and and uh, and I believe that most officers on the force really wouldn't do this, uh, would have no part of it. Um, I do think, however, that uh, once it gets started, it's it's really hard to stop, and and we have not succeeded in setting up the mechanisms to punish the officers who are headed in that direction. Uh, you may remember a few years ago, a majority of the city council tried to get a list of repeater cops, or uh, cops with 10 or more brutality complaints right. against them. The city would not release it. They had the list. Yes. And the city would not release it. And, right. uh, it, you know, and, and I learned earlier this year that the city does not even track uh, if I'm an officer and I have 15 brutality suits and they've been settled for millions of dollars, the city can't tell you. If, if they call up and say, uh, if I call up and say, uh, can I have the, the, the figures on the John Conroy brutality cases, they don't have them. They have no idea. They've got to go look them up. Wow. Wow. Uh, we, this is, uh, we've been covering not only the bird story, but um, we, we have Tracy Siska on our show regularly. He's with the Chicago Justice Project, who um, uh, I think achieves um, amazing feats by being even-handed as he approaches issues with the police department, which he struggles mightily to maintain that even-handedness so that he continues to have access and the respect of the officers who are not committing crimes. But this city has paid so much for the brutality of a small number of cops and for the wrongful convictions of uh, then State Rep State's Attorney Richard M. Daley's office. Um, I, 
if if people aren't outraged at torture, torturing the torturable class, could they not at least be outraged that our our minute coffers are emptied by paying for these guys and their bad acts? Uh, well, you would think. Um, Richard Brzezik has a great solution to this. The former... Yes, uh, the former police superintendent. He says uh, for every, uh, every time the city settles a brutality case, you deduct that from the payroll of the police department. I think that's a fine idea. Was Brzezik a good guy in the old days? Uh, well, <laughs> or is he getting better in his older age. You know, he he, he was uh, always a mixed bag. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he had he had a lot of things going uh, on inside. John of him. Conroy, we're going to run out of time, uh, so we do have a few more minutes. Can you tell us about the status of the Burge case? Where is John Burge now? Will anything happen to him? Anything has happened to him? Uh, fill us in on all of that. Uh, John Burge is in prison. Uh, he actually is in the same federal prison as Bernie Madoff. And, uh, oh, I'm sure that's a rough scene. And, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we're up here grinning. And, anyway, uh, he, um, there will not be further consequences for him. Um, the, I understand though that the, uh, uh, U.S. Attorney hasn't given up, um, that the U.S. Attorney may prosecute other officers, um, and that could happen, you know, it's got to happen in the next uh, two years or the statute of limitations will run out, this, this, so. Uh, what, let me ask you to, stepping into the present and future, are, are you, um, are you still handling such cheery subjects in your writing and your future projects? Um, uh, not really. I, I am, uh, <laughs> I, I've accepted a job uh, teaching investigation to law students. I'll start August 1st. Uh, Congratulations. I'm doing some investigations for a legal clinic, so uh, I'm sort of headed out of that territory. Uh-huh. I bet it'll come back for you <laughs> at some time. Because uh, I think once you're uh, you you got the vibe of social justice, you'll probably keep it. Do you do you <laughs> have you run across Jamie Colvin in your? Yeah, we've had him on the show too, um, because he worked a lot with police brutality in the projects and yes, safe, uh, Stateway yeah. Gardens. And yeah. Let me let me just ask you uh, the People's Law Office. Did uh, what's your take on them? They played a good role in a lot of this. Oh, they're uh, really some of the heroes of this whole story. Yep. Uh, they really beat their head against the wall for years, you know, with clients nobody else wanted. Yeah. And, uh, and they were right all along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They generally have been. Yeah. John Conroy, I want to thank you for coming on. I know we had to twist your arm, but uh, it's always a pleasure to run into you. Thank you so much uh, We for hold your good you in work. high esteem. And... Uh, uh, we look forward to talking to you a lot more and seeing you more and seeing more plays, seeing some movies. I'm sure you've got a lot of things going on. Uh, Angel gave us the high sign that the time that we're looking at is a little bit uh, incorrect, so we got to wind it up. I want to thank everybody who helps make this show possible. I want to thank uh, not only Angel Herrera, Paul and Mary Wozniak, uh, Eli Sloan downtown, Laura, Laura Herman, Herman, Lisa, Lisa Smith. Smith, and Daniel Kugler, and I am Michael James. And I'm Katie Hogan. And we encourage you to do good in the world because the world needs all the good that you do. And so let's go out there and remember all power to the people. Thanks for tuning in. We've been listening to Live from the Heartland.